مبارك فيه الحمد لله والشكر والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن غلاء وضعف وإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله خير الحد حديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, the first thing I would like to um, get some clarity on or agreement on uh, is about these phones. Now, I'm not opposed to anybody recording it if it's for yourself. But I don't want to see it tomorrow up on YouTube, day two, her two, nobody else two. Because that is not ethical. Uh, when a lecture is given, the speaker should have a right, have a, have a chance to edit, to review, before it just be, becomes world news. Uh, because I'm talking to my family. It's not a discussion for the world. So if we have that agreement, you can let the phones go. If you don't agree with me, take your phone, cut it off. That's it. Do we agree? Thank you. Um, dear brothers and sisters, um, you know, uh, there's a, uh, an ether of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, Khairul Kalam ma qalla wa dalla. That the best uh, speech is the one that is qalla from Qalil uh, and dalla from Dalil. So it means that the best speech is the one, it's short, but it have the necessary delay, proofs and evidence. Um, I know that normally um, when I go places, people say, uh, Sheikh Khalid Yassin, he's a, a long time da'i, he's a well-known da'i, blah, blah, blah. And that's just called branding. And I appreciate that. And uh, there's no work that's better than the work of da'wah, according to what Allah subhanahu wa said. But there's a dimension of da'wah that goes beyond just teaching and preaching and talking about Islam and arguing with Christians and so forth and so on. Uh, it also has to do with helping Muslims to reform themselves and then helping also Muslims after reforming themselves to reform the society where they live at. This is also a part of da'wah. So this is the dimension that I want to talk about tonight. And it comes from uh, um, a, work, uh, a research paper that I've been working on for maybe the last two or three years. Um, uh, because I have a different vision uh, about America, I have a different vision about my role in America, I have a different vision about the Muslims and their role and responsibility in America uh, than I did when I was 45. I'm now 65. So I want to talk about the realities of our situation. And just to uh, make a point, you know, uh, our president, Mr. Obama, he came to our backyard today. He flew into, he flew into our backyard and he flew to the house of not some really important person. He flew to the house of George Clooney, who's just an actor. Can you believe that? Why would Mr. Obama, the President of the United States, why would he fly into this area and then be helicoptered over to George Clooney's house? Do you want to know why? Because George Clooney and some of his other people have guaranteed Mr. Obama that we are going to make sure that in the state of California, you're going to get 600,000, 1 million, 2 million, whatever votes. Secondly, we're going to raise 20 million, 30 million, 40 million for your, basically your campaign chest. As simple as that. Mr. Obama doesn't know Mr. Clooney. Clooney doesn't know Mr. Obama. It's about influence. And so Mr. Obama, the President of the United States, is going to be with, he's going to go to, he's going to interact with people that have a concern about America. People who themselves are willing to put their money where their mouth is. People who are willing to get involved, that means to participate. People who are willing to compete. And people who, after competing, have the intention to win. And the reason why Muslims, he's not going to visit any Muslim place to get votes. Although there are 8 million Muslims in this country, or there's at least 7.2 million in, in the USA, and maybe another 800,000 or 1.2 million in Canada. Where's the consolidation at? Where's the consolidation of resources? Where's the consolidation of people? Where's the consolidation of, of institutions? Where's the consolidation of, of focus and uh, our, our vision? Where is it at? Is it in Isna? Is it in Ikna? Where is it? everyone will say I don't know and it's because we Muslims we are more concerned about ourselves whether it's my family whether it's my community whether it's my ethnic group whether it's my masjid whether it's my, uh, my, my, my ideological persuasion 
you know, whether, you know, whether this or whether that. That's what we're concerned about. And very rarely do any concerns of Muslims go beyond the person or the community or the organization or the ethnicity or the ideological group that they belong in. Very rarely do you even hear anybody on the member ever saying to the Muslims, we have a responsibility as Muslims living in America not just to take something from America but to give something back. I don't want to see a, a show of hands, but I know you probably haven't heard on any member in this state somebody saying to the Muslims that we Muslim Americans, we can't just be here marking time, collecting money, sending it back to our country, building our homes, setting up businesses, building madrasas, whatever the case might be. Then we want to be respected by people because we build a madrasa, because we build masjids, we want people to respect us. You know, we are reactionary Muslims. We don't want to be called bad guys. We don't want to be called fanatics. We don't want to be called extremists. We don't want to be called those bad names. Just as long as America says, oh, those guys, they're good guys. Just leave them alone. We're satisfied. That is the whole game. Blame you, condemn you, dehumanize you, do all kinds of things just to do what? to castrate you, to make you so that you have no effect in America, and even Americans, even if they think you're good, they still pass you by when it comes to decision making. This cannot continue to go on. So for me, maybe I can be called a radical, but I don't mind, you know, because, you know, if you had gastric, into, uh, 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 gastric, uh, 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 what you call it, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, doctor, where well, you had some kind of, um, uh, no, no, you had a, a blockage. Yeah, if you had a, a, a bowel obstruction or you had some kind of aneurysm or whatever it would call, it would call for what kind of surgery? Radical surgery. Nobody would mind radical surgery then. So sometimes a speaker or a doctor, a, 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 an intellectual, has got to use radical procedures and words to bring the message home. Now I'm not calling myself that. But maybe after I finish, some people will say, you know, that guy, he's kind of radical. But you know, it's not that. Uh, I feel very passionate about what I'm talking about because I don't know about you guys and you ladies, but me, I'm an American. I'm not somebody that just moved here, I'm not just a revert. I'm just not like an African American who just happens to be here and a Muslim. No, this is my country. And I'm concerned about my country. And yes, I do have my own sympathies, my own feelings about Mecca, about Medina, about Egypt, and about Tunisia, and about this place, and Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and all over the world. These are my family. Every Muslim country is part of my family. But guess what? That's not my home. I've lived in Egypt, I've lived in Mecca, I've lived in Medina, but that's not my home. My home is the United States of America. And the second thing is, I still believe today after traveling to over 73 countries in the world, there is no greater liberties or resources that exist in the world that we have free access to other than America. And if you don't think so, you don't agree with me, bring your passport, put it right here on the table, and go back wherever it is. Start from scratch. Nobody will do it. So let's not be hypocrites. Let's admit that we are like flies sitting on the wall. Let's admit you know that you, we are aloof, A-L-O-O-F. That's like, like your mind up in the sky somewhere. Let's admit that we have isolated and detached ourselves. Let's admit, okay, and then why should other Americans who are active, involved, making investments, right or wrong, why should they care about us? Why? America's not built on that. America's built upon participation, competition, and winning. Those are the three words that America is built on. But before you participate, you have to make a commitment. That's called belief. So Islam is just like that. Islam is based upon first belief, right? First belief, right? Is it correct? Iman. The first thing, the first out uh, of uh, canon Islam is what? Iman. Aman tu billahi wa malaikatu wa blah 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 this and that. Iman. After that, you have to do amal to show what? That you are engaged. So Iman upon the tongue has no meaning until the body moves you know, into what gear. So America is built on the same principles. In case you haven't read, 
I suggest that each one of us go tonight and read the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. It's only five lines. How many people here can say, old or young, that you can stand up right now and recite the preamble to the Constitution? You have been here 20 years, you've been here 30 years, you've been here 40 years. This is the Constitution, which is the ideological basis of the legislative document for this country. So how many can say that they can stand up and recite, like the Fatiha, just the preamble to the Constitution? And if the old people can, you certainly know your children can. How many people here could recite just the first opening statements of the Declaration of Independence? How they gained their independence from their mother, England. How many people here could just recite the first three or four paragraphs of the Constitution of the United States, the opening statements of the Constitution? This is because all the time we've been here, we haven't given it a fair review. We've been preoccupied with nostalgia. If I came from Bosnia, I got nostalgia about that. If I came from Pakistan, I still got nostalgia about that. If I came from Bangladesh, I got nostalgia about that. So how long are we gonna be involved in this drunkenness which is called nostalgia? I mean, things are going on in this country. You, you guys are lucky. It just so happened that this, this uh, Article 8, is that what it's called, Doctor? Uh, uh, Article, uh, Article 8, the, the, the same-sex marriage bill, what's it called? Propagation. Huh? Propagation 8 or whatever? It was just defeated by a small number. But it's going back to the Supreme Court, and I'm almost guaranteed it's going to pass. Now 17, 17 states in the United States of America, they have passed it. Do you think they passed it because they're all gay? Do you think they passed it because they sympathetic towards the gay? No, they passed it because the gay people have more power than almost anybody else in this country. Now, I mean, look, for me, 20 years ago, I call it like it is. Faggots are faggots and lesbians are lesbians and dogs are dogs. But you know, today's world, we can't speak like that. We have to say that uh, these are abominable people. <laughs> we have to use some intellectual terminologies that's acceptable and digestible. And I know how to do that now. Nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, I want everybody to listen to this ayah. We, we hear it every Jum'ah. You know, when the Imam is almost finished with the khutbah through Jum'ah, he recites an ayah almost everywhere in the world. And most of us, we're not listening to the ayah because we're taking it as a signal that he's winding down and we're getting ready to pray. What's the ayah? Awuzu billahi min ash-shaytan wa jinn bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim Inna allaha ya'muru bil adl wa al-ihsan wa ita'i dhul qurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai wa al-munqal wa al-baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tathakkaroon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has ordered us Inna allaha ya'muru bil adl Verily Allah has ordered you upon what? Justice Wa al-ihsan What is ihsan? Well, some people call it goodness, but it's not goodness. It's benevolence. That is, the wealthy Muslims are supposed to contribute to the society with benevolence and show the people that we Muslims, we are good-hearted. We're not just good-minded, we are good-hearted. Our human services, our material resources are available to develop this country. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he described this in the Quran, he said, Kuntum khaira. He talked to the Quranic generation. Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. Ta'maroon bil ma'roof wa tanhaoon bil munkar wa tu'minoon bil la. Allah has talked to the Quranic generation. He says to them, you are, and by default, he's talking to us, right? You are the best nation evolved for the entire humanity. Why? Because you order what is correct and good, ma'roof, and you prevent, you resist that which is evil and corrupt, and because you keep your covenant with Allah. So how can Muslims, how can the Muslim leaders stand on the member? How can they stand up in the masjid? How can they lecture in the universities? And they didn't say anything about same-sex marriage? All they just say is that it's haram. 
Or maybe they're even afraid to say that. They say, well, it's not a lifestyle that we agree to agree with. We think it's wrong. What are you talking about? Your children are going to be taught. One out of every five of the teachers that are going to teach your children are going to be either gay or they're going to be married to the same sex. And you just say, oh, we don't agree with that. I mean, listen to this. You know, Muslims are eight million strong. How many Mormons are in this country? I guarantee you that there are more Muslims in this country than there are Mormons. And certainly more Catholics, more Protestants, and so forth and so on. But guess what? The Mormons today are the strongest, most powerful, most influential, and the most wealthy Christians in America. And to prove it, they have a presidential candidate that's running against Mr. Obama this year. Is it? See that? It's not like a miracle, just a natural evolution, a result of competition. Secondly, the Mormons have proved to us what can be done by a group of people that were hated because nobody was hated. The Mormons was hated in America long before Muslims got here. They were hated, they were repressed, they were punished, they were burned, they were stoned, they were driven out until they arrived there in the Salt Lake City there, in Salt Lake in Nevada, Utah, man. So they went through that persecution, but they persevered. They persevered and see what their station is today. Not only that, it is just not they have a presidential candidate, but the Mormons are con in control of an entire state. There are no Jews in America that you can say that they control an entire state. There are no Christians in America that can say that they control an entire state. No political party can control the state. Maybe a particular family in Texas can control the entire state, but no religious group can control a state in America except the Mormons. Just look at the history. No one can become a governor of the state of Utah if they're not Mormons. So why couldn't Muslims do it? I mean, do the, do the Mormons have a better conduct than we do? Do they have a better book than we do? <clears throat> do they have a better reference than do we do? Is it that they are more handsome than we are? They're more articulate than we are? They're more American than we are? No, that's not the case. They have consolidated themselves upon leadership. They have consolidated themselves and their resources up to participate. They have consolidated themselves to compete and they have consolidated their wealth in order to win. Now, according to the climate that exists today right now, it looks like Mr. Obama is definitely going to win the race. I, I mean, that's what my conclusion is anyway. Unless he falls on his face or some conspiracy, you know, because these Yahudis and other kinds of people, these Zionists, you know, they, they bring a lot of unexpected stuff up at the last minute. But unless they bring up something that is very heavy and very profound, something that nobody knows about right now, it looks almost like a landslide to me. And guess what? America doesn't really care that Mr. Obama is black. They don't care anymore about that. They're beyond that. America is the only country in the world that can move beyond color. Do you think there will ever be a black king in Saudi Arabia? Do you ever think there's going to be a black president in Pakistan? Do you think there'll be a black president in Tunisia or Egypt? No. Absolutely not. The chance is not even, it's not even like, not even a chance of a fly's wing. But America still has some racist tendencies, but they have moved beyond race when it comes to competition. What America is looking for is two things. They're looking for progress, they're looking for change, they're looking for somebody that's dynamic. They look for somebody they can ride on. And right now, Mr. Obama seems to have it. He's a moral candidate. And if Muslims are smart enough, I'm not saying that Mr. Obama is the best candidate, but I'm saying Muslims need to choose which horse they want to go behind. Because if you don't choose at all, guess what? By virtue of not voting yourself, you have given up your vote. Because in America, power comes from two ways. The ballot or the bullet. There's only two ways to get the power in America. There can be a civil war. But America is beyond civil war right now. It's people that have resources in order to influence the ballot box. That is it. America doesn't even care anymore that his middle name, you know, is Hussein. 
the name of the grandson of our prophet saw Sam. They don't care about that. People are going to say things about it, but they really don't care as long as Mr. Obama performs. As long as he performs, that's the country that I like. A country that gives everybody a chance if he's able to perform. Now, having said that, brothers and sisters, I want to remind all of us, mashallah, that I, I mentioned four words. Belief, which is commitment. Participation, which is involvement. Competition, which in Islam is healthy and necessary. Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْتَبِكُ khairat. Strive, struggle, race, compete. For what? For khair. What's khair? Khair means the ability to make the best decisions too. Not just to be a good person. So what our constitution has inside of it, the structure of this constitution, not the aims and objectives, but the ingredients. Because the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Hancock, okay, George Washington, these guys, they had influence with Muslims. They had read the Quran and they were Masons. And they understood that we needed a new philosophy. A philosophy that came from a civilization that had power and influence and that ruled the world for 600 years. So what they did, they took ingredients out of Islam and out of the Quran and they put it inside the American Constitution. It's right there. But we Muslims, we don't even read it. So what I'm calling Muslims and reminding Muslims about is to ask yourself, why are you here? You just here to earn money? You just here to go to school? You just like a bump on the log? You don't have a voice? Well, if you don't, guess what? The Prophet Sallallahu said, if you fail to enjoy the right and forbid the wrong, if you fail, you ignore it, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will visit you with a calamity from himself. So that when you call upon him, he's not answering you. And when you seek his help, he's not giving it to you. Because the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us upon the path of doing what? Making sure that we ourselves reform ourselves as he said, قَدْ عَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا This is the theme of Islam. The theme of Islam is not kicking off your shoes at the door. The theme of Islam is not just performing a prayer, some kind of ritual. The theme of Islam is not Ramadan to Ramadan. The theme of Islam is not just building madrasas and having our children reciting Quran like birds. The theme of Quran is not just performing Hajj. The theme of Quran is just not making empty dua. The theme of Islam is to be involved. The theme of Islam is investment and struggle. Here I'm not talking about subverting the society. No, I'm talking about what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said. You know the, you know the parable the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gave. He gave us the parable of a group of people that got on the boat. You remember that parable? A group of people got on the boat together, and some was on the upper deck, some was on the bottom deck. And uh, the people on the upper deck, they put the water on the top deck. I mean, that's the right place to put it. They didn't have no motors. Because they put the water on the top deck, the water has natural gravitation to go down, is it? But the people on the bottom deck, they were jealous. They said, forget it, we'll get our own water. We'll drill a hole in the bottom of the boat and get our own water. <laughs> so the Prophet saw him, he said, if those in the top of the deck, if they allow the people in the bottom of the boat to drill a hole in the bottom of the boat, they will all drown. America is our boat. The moral-minded people in America are in the top of the boat. <laughs> but the immoral people, some who are smooth criminals, you know, some of the most immoral people in America, they look the best. They're branded well. They got pinstripe suits. They got beautiful houses. They got nice cars. They got nice families. If you want to look at them, they look like a model of society. But these are the people Allah refers to in the Quran as an malak they, the, they are the small group, the 1% in America, who care nothing about God, who care nothing about the people, who care nothing about justice, who care nothing about themselves, that 1%. Huh? But what about the other people who's in the bottom of the boat? Who is plenty of the majority of people? The drug dealers. What about those people? What about the people that promote gambling? What about the people that produce pornography? 
What about the people, you understand, who, who, uh, who, who promote this here tobacco industry? What about the people, you understand, who promote, you understand, the, the alcohol industry? I mean, these, just think about these four industries by themselves. We don't, we don't need to get into no conspiracies or anything like that. More people have been destroyed and more lives have been destroyed. More people have died. More calamities have happened with, between alcohol and drugs and cigarettes and pornography than any four industries in the world. And when you combine those industries in America, they are bigger than General Motors. They're bigger than the auto industry. They're bigger than uh, 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 General Electric. They are bigger than you know, almost any industry in America. So these are the people that's in the bottom of the boat. And what do Muslims have to say about it? Nothing. In fact, unfortunately, many Muslims, when they come to America, they claim that they don't have any choice. So the first thing they do is they open up a little small store, and what do they sell? <laughs> they're selling alcohol. They're selling chenzia. They're selling lotto and, uh, 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 and other kinds of uh, 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 gambling devices. They're selling uh, uh, girly magazines, for YH magazines. In fact, I just did a study myself, not just, just now, but the study we've done on a consistent basis for the last 27 years, we have found that the majority of the small shops in America the, 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 that sell alcohol and beer and khanzir and lottery and for wise magazines belong to the Muslims. And we, Muslims, we walk up and down the neighborhoods and we see our Muslim brothers selling and we just say, Salaam alaykum, I can't have had it. <laughs> or we might say, Akhi, it's not good. I saw my shot. I saw same people. Same people, when it comes to, uh, on, on, uh, on the Ramadan, they're going to be right here. They will be standing right behind the Imam. And when the Imam says, Inna lil muttaqeena mafaza hadaika wa a'naba wa kawaiba ataraba, they're going to be right in the back front and they're going to be saying, <laughs> crying. And while they're crying, their cash register inside their store is going jing jing, jing jing. Jing Jing while they're in the masjid. Those same people, they're making Hajj every other year. And while they're on, on Arafat, you know saying Ya Rab, Ya Rab, their store is also going what? Jing Jing, Jing Jing, Jing Jing. And Allah already to Prophet and said, how can Allah answer them? How is Allah going to answer somebody who's dealing haram openly and blatantly that he's going to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But the worst thing about it is that they are praying with us and we are not saying anything. And whoever says nothing, silence is consent. If I ask you to marry your daughter, and you don't say anything at all, Islamically, that's consent. You have to say no. So we must have to ask ourselves, what are we doing in this society? What's our choice? What's our vision? What are we following? What are we contributing? What's our vision? What's our plan? Because if you don't have a plan today, your children will not have a plan tomorrow. And the basic rule is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So brothers and sisters, I know probably you were expecting maybe, you know, maybe something a little bit more um, uh, involving doctrine and tradition and taqwa and, you know, uh, you know, obtaining and knowledge. And you know, a lot of those beautiful subjects that we talk about. But for me, no. If there's trash in the middle of the street, I do not want to be talking no pretty talk. What I want to do is move the trash out of the street. Look, I want to just mention something to you. It's something which is called, it's symptomatic. The doctor, he knows, uh, there's something they call symptomatic medicine. And kind of most of the medicine we use today is like symptomatic. Is it correct? That is, the doctor goes and he talks to you first. You know, he looks at you and he establishes a rapport with you and he says, how do you feel? What do you do? Where do you live? You know, what's your lifestyle? You know, so and so. And then while he's doing that, he's looking for symptoms. If he has to test your urine or your blood, or, you know, feel this or feel that, it's based on symptomatic medicine. And there is a certain amount of accuracy involved in symptomatic medicine. So it means that we should be honest with ourselves and also use a symptomatic approach. You know, did you know that 90% of the mosques in America they have this symptom that when they come to the mosque, instead of taking their shoes and putting them on the rack where they belong, what do the Muslims do? The Muslims kick off the shoes just like this here and just go over there and pray. 
Do you know when your shoes, you kick your shoes off and you put them in the middle of the door, your shoes are causing the angels to curse you because you made them as an obstruction for the other people because the prophet of him said, faith has over 70 branches, the smallest of which is what? Removing an other from the tariq. Subhanallah. Say Subhanallah. See something, this is symptomatic. So if I'm a non-Muslim, and I just kind of like peek inside this uh, mosque of where the Muslims is at because, you know, I heard they're kind of like dynamic. I mean, they're good people and all that. I've never been to a church and find the people, you know, see me throw their shoes on over there like that. I've never been to a synagogue. I've never been to a Hindu temple. I mean, I've never been to a Buddhist temple. I take off their shoes also. But they are very organized. They are very systematic. They are very, uh, 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 what do you call it? They have a, a system. They are very careful. They have a concern. But for some reason or another, Muslims, they are very careless. And let me ask you, like a, like a Japanese Muslim asked me, they said, said me, Shit, uh, is it a part of the religion that when we enter the mosque, we just kick off our shoes like that? <laughs> I told him, no. He said, well, why do the Muslims do that? I said, look, it's just a part of their culture that they have adopted over the years, and somehow or another, this is not justified, but they just, they don't care. It's like people that use the toilet, and they don't flush the toilet. It's like, you know, we go to a conference, just, I mean, we're talking about our family, so don't get attitude, don't say why the check is getting down on us. I'm not, I'm just happy to be at North Hollywood Mosque, okay, I, tomorrow maybe I'll be in Masjid Malik Fahid or something like that, Allah wow. So, you know, I'm just, just my family, so you guys don't mind, man, being, just being honest. And after all, if you got like an attitude, longitude, altitude, whatever, you know, tomorrow, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll be gone in a couple of days anyway, you know? So, so, you know, I'm saying we need to improve our, we need to improve our presentation. We need to come people of the people. Go and visit a church. I mean, I don't know how long this mosque has been here, and I'm not being critical of, of anything. But we should not be concerned about building a bigger mosque. We should be concerned about building a better community. Islam is not about building, putting up buildings. Islam is about putting up structures of human beings. Islam is about the development of human beings, not the building of beautiful messages. And yes, I understand that if, you know, over a certain amount of time, it's just a matter of mathematics, exponential math. Now, a certain amount of time, this space here and that space here, either you got to go up or you got to go out because there's not enough space, at least on Juma. Is that correct or not? But that doesn't mean it justifies you spending a million or two million or three million just for people who come on Juma. Go and see other people in this, this area right here who have a church or a synagogue for 15 years or 20 years. See, you'll find out they don't just own a building they own property all in that same area. They have built schools for themselves in that area. They have built institutions in that area. They are engaged in participating in American society. Why? Because they're Americans. And they understand that that's a platform of their faith. What's wrong with us? So brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, I want to remind myself that we have an obligation uh, of Muslims living in this country. And I quoted some ayats of the Quran. I don't want to quote a whole lot because you don't need to. I think the premise of what I've, I've recited already is enough. Uh, the hadith of the Prophet is very clear. The Quran is very clear. And uh, I'm reminding myself first, uh, because this is my community. Uh, I'm a Muslim, you know, since 1965. And uh, I've, I've, I've traveled the world, I think, a little bit, 73 countries. So I think I have seen the Muslims. Okay? And I thank God all the time, all the time, that I found Islam before I found the Muslims. However, it's like a doctor gives you the bad news. He says, you know what? After he gives you the diagnosis, he says, you know Khalid, or Abdullah, or Aisha? I just want to tell you that. I've dis discovered a malignant tumor. That's like bad news, right? I've discovered a malignant tumor. But then he says, right after that, the same breath, but guess what? I got good news for you. We've caught it in time. Allah work, bro. Say Allah Akbar. Allah. See, so it's better for us to make the diagnosis. You know, check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's what the young boys say. <laughs> see, see, you make an evaluation of yourself first. 
as Allah subhanahu wa says, Ya ayyuhu adina mutakullah, wa kulu qawlan sadeeda. Allah says a lot of things in the Quran that tell us to check yourself, be mindful of yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from the fire. So Allah said that to us. So brothers and sisters, we have a malignant situation. But guess what? We have time to correct it with the right thinking, follow up with the right actions. Uh, before, because uh, you know, this, the, the, the food was jumping when I got here. So I mean, you know, the, the food got us hot, that's the process I'm saying, right? So, you know, when you got the food, like jumping through these doors, that basmati rice is like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like the Muslim personality should be like basmati rice. If, you know, you and that, the Muslim had a real Muslim personality, you ain't got to give no dawah. They would smell it. <laughs> So, you know, since the, 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 the food has a hop upon us, I don't want to take more time than what is, uh, what is the, uh, 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 necessary. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, take five minutes and say to you guys, I'd like to make a pause for a commercial. You know what that is, right? A commercial break? Yeah, because we have a project and we have a program. We don't just float down from the sky. We don't just come like, like some aliens and float it down. We have a project and said, mashallah, we, our office, our main office is in Seattle, Washington. You know, we're kind of like a cousin city going up north. Uh, we have a production office down in Columbus, Ohio, and we're setting up a, a, an office in Shaoqi. Uh, and we have a project that we believe is like, I think, I kind of feel, I was telling Dr. Uh, 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 Faraz and uh, uh, some of his family members, I, I kind of feel like uh, Michael Zuckerberg, what he felt like there was only nine years ago. You know who that is, right? This is the youngest billionaire in the world. He's not even a genius, even. He's, he's not that smart. But he's the youngest billionaire in the world. And guess what? He launched, he launched Facebook eight years ago. And today, Facebook has outstripped Google, MSN Messenger, all the major ones. He passed them. He just sold, I think he just opened up the market for 150, 150 billion? 150 billion for Facebook? So look, for me, I mean he's an American, I'm an American. He's not that smart, I'm a little smart. It's about media. You know, so if it's about media, it's not about him, it's about the people. So we've launched the project because we don't want to be slamming people and you know, blasting people and you know, cost catarizing people. No, we don't want to do that. What we want to say is that Google is a search engine that's powerful. But we have an alternative. If you go to Google and put in porn, P-O-R-N, in case some of y'all haven't done that, that's a joke. If you put in P-O-R-N, in porn on Google, you get one billion, eight hundred million choices. And if you say, well, I'm not even going there, so I don't care. But your children will go 